Welcome to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, where we are going to tackle the prospect of colonizing Mars. Not the colony layout, not the food supply, not even the spaceships required or the habitats they would live in, but instead how we think the society of colonists would have to be selected and structured. And although the information we are going to present will be referring to Musk's plan to create a city of a million people on Mars by 2050, this really would apply to any other similar scheme trying to pretend that a sustained human presence on Mars could possibly be viable. That being said, Musk really is the only ringleader currently leading that particular media circus. Bezos with Blue Origin is more a proponent of O'Neill cylinders, probably because Jared K. O'Neill, who first proposed these structures in detail, was one of Jeff's props when he attended Princeton. ULA is quite content with their current mission architecture arrangement with NASA, eventually allowing men and women to arrive safely on the planet, with plans to get them home afterwards, and Virgin is led by Sir Richard Branson, who up until 2019 was speaking about getting satellites to Mars in 2022, but those ambitions seem to have died down somewhat since. Sir Richard Branson now seems more interested in space tourism that is a little closer to home. There have also been several other organizations come and go with the stated goal of taking humans to the Red Planet. Mars One, founded by Bas Lansdorp, of course, turned out to be a multi-million dollar scam that even the media completely fell for. One of the key advisors to that bankrupt venture was Robert Zubrin, who may well deserve his own episode in the future because despite having no current affiliation with any legitimate space agency, he is still constantly referred to as some sort of authority on Mars. As an example, recently he was interviewed when Ingenuity first took flight on Mars, despite Zubrin having absolutely nothing to do with that mission whatsoever. These three people did work on the Ingenuity project. Do you know their names? Zubrin often quotes from Mars Direct, which is a paper he was paid to co-author for Martin Marietta with David Baker, who never seems to get mentioned despite being the senior scientist on the Apollo missions. Since Zubrin became unemployed in 2008, he's using that paper and several books that he's written based on it to become his own make work project by mentioning Mars so often that people actually think he is an authority on the subject. But the more we see his posts on Twitter and Facebook and his face in the news, the more we realize that this guy and Elon Musk are two delusional peas from the same pod. Musk is on record as saying that anybody who wants to buy a ticket to Mars will be able to do so and start a brand new life with thousands of jobs available to them on Mars. He's even mentioned price tags for those tickets ranging from $500,000 possibly down to $100,000 which are ridiculously small amounts on their face considering the logistics of such an undertaking. Musk has also mentioned the ability for would-be colonists to finance their new life and work off their debt when they reach Mars. The term for this is indentured servitude, more commonly known as voluntary slavery that you work at until your debt is paid off. Just as an FYI, that's how a lot of Irish people made it across the Atlantic to start their new life in America. People wanting to sign up for this insane proposition have to realize that they are going to die doing it. Whether it's during the launch or in transit or on the surface of Mars, they are going to die. Musk told the entire world as much several times, including during a recent interview where he didn't even bother to wear shoes or half his hair. You know, it's, it's dangerous, uh, it's uncomfortable, um, it's a long journey. You might not, you know, come back alive. Honestly, a bunch of people probably will die in the beginning. It's, yeah. it's tough sledding over there. You'll notice how he says other people are going to die. Not him, though. The self-proclaimed imperator of Mars won't be on that ship with him. But it seems he's fine to send other people to their death, though. But as for taking anybody who wants to go, when it comes right down to it, that would be a tremendous and fatal mistake. We have used the analogy before of traveling on a starship as compared to serving on a submarine, and touched a little on the psychological effects a journey might have on people. In fact, our episode 12 does a direct comparison between starship and an LA class attack sub for comparative living conditions. Today we are going to go through the Submariner's psychological evaluation process as presented by Dr. Mark N. Bing of the Naval Submarine Medical Research Laboratory with regards to the SARS known as the Submarine Attrition Risk Scale. For this entire section, we're going to replicate the exact information from these materials into easier to view frames, because honestly, the PowerPoint frames that they use are seriously hard on the eyes. Let's go through some relevant facts on Navy-wide attrition. Approximately 40% of all Navy recruits across all fleets 
fail to complete their first enlistment. Annual financial losses in the tens of millions of dollars per the GAO. GAO is the Government Accountability Office. Keep in mind that military service is not compulsory in the U.S., so two in five of the people who volunteer for military service train for up to eight weeks, graduate boot camp, are deployed, and then leave the service before completing their first tour of duty. On Earth, if you quit, you can simply fly home. If you're on your way to Mars, that's not an option. Second relevant fact, psychological disorders are the leading cause of hospitalization in the first two years of service, according to the Accession Medical Standards Analysis and Research Activity, 1999. For active duty personnel between 1990 and 1999, 23% of all hospital bed days involved a mental disorder diagnosis. All told, the largest category of Navy recruit attrition is psychological, and these numbers are from the Navy at large across all fleets, not specifically submariners. The next frame of the presentation details the unique aspects of working in a sub. We're going to compare that to a crew on a ship heading through space. No personal space? Check. No escape from workplace conflicts? Check. No sunlight for long periods? Check. In fact, for Martian colonists, they'll never feel direct sunlight again on their skin, where the sailors can at least go topside when the sub services. Disrupted sleep and wake cycles and sleep deprivation. Yes, according to the astronauts on the ISS. Concern for danger of excessive sea pressure. Well, this would be an ever-present concern of hull breach, so as you're traveling through space, check. And concern for danger from enemy targets. Military targets, no. But solar storms, cosmic rays, micrometeorites, object collision? Definitely. Check. And that checklist is for sailors in close quarters on Earth. For Martians in transit, add these ever-present situations and concerns to the mix. Removal from their home planet. No possibility of rescue or evacuation. Ever-present concern about supplies of stale recycled air and water recycled from pee. Limited and delayed communications with family and friends mental and physical rigors of takeoff and landing, additional physical decline due to weightlessness, and solar and cosmic radiation damage, including neurological damage. Not to mention, a sailor's tour of duty is typically only 60 to 80 days, and then the crew swaps out with another crew assigned to that boat. Their schedule is set out ahead of time for three years, so they know exactly when their next shore leave is going to be. Again, not the case if you're headed to Mars. To help determine the mental fitness of naval applicants, the Navy screens submarine volunteers very carefully because it is in everyone's best interest to do so. Key to their selection process is testing called subscreen, and the first part of this is a written self-reporting test covering 260 questions that determine where an applicant falls on five different dimensional scales and what those scales indicate. According to retired Captain Way Woolrich, millennials are creating unique challenges for the Navy in finding suitable candidates. Those scales are as follows. Procedural scales indicating whether or not the responses are faked or extreme. Submarine scales where the applicant may have problems submerging or is uncertain about subs. Effective scales indicating a depressed mood or anxiety. Socialization scales including whether or not they have aggressive and destructive tendencies or socially isolate. And additional scales indicating whether or not suicidal thoughts or claustrophobic feelings would come into play. NASA has a much more direct way of testing how claustrophobic you are, as Commander Scott Kelly told Neil deGrasse Tyson on a recent episode of Star Talk. And, and how do they do that? <laughs> they put you in a rubber bag, you know, you kind of crawl up into a ball, this like <laughs> thick rubber bag uh, with a very hairy, heavy zipper. They put uh, electrodes on you and push you into a closet and don't tell you how long you're going to be there. So okay, if you have claustrophobia. I, I want to scream easy. right now. According to this chart, using the subscreen process, out of every 100 volunteers for submarine duty, 90 are not referred and 10 are referred for further consideration. Of those 10, on average, one will be transferred to surface fleet, and two will be split off as administrative separations or ADCEPs for other reasons. An ADCEP is basically a dishonorable discharge. Seven of the 10 will continue on to the BESS, Basic Enlisted Submarine School meaning 7% of those who volunteer will make it through the process after this careful screening is done. And even then, one in four will fail to make it through their first deployment on the sub. So the final breakdown is that only 5% of the people who think they are cut out for the job can actually make it through their first tour of duty. 
but Musk wants to sell tickets to anybody who wants to go. He'll even pay your way up front if you're willing to work off your loan once you get there. What could possibly go wrong? You have to wonder how that would have worked out if Mars One wasn't a scam and had gone ahead as promised, considering applicants were being judged solely on their ability to fundraise. We're going to take a break here before heading into our next part where we're going to go through what type of society those volunteers would be inserted into while they are off world. But first, we've got something to share with our supporters. This afternoon, as we were finalizing these edits, our subscriber count on YouTube rolled over 10,000, which is a goal we never ever thought possible in the first year of a contrarian channel such as ours. Everybody at the Common Sense Skeptic channel would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for making this possible for us. Thank you so much for your continued and your growing support. Part 2 of Colonizing Mars is coming up shortly. <laughs>